tied to how what's happening in the body, how good the uh, brain is being perfused. But the pupils are a little bit more complicated. Whether the pupils dilate or constrict has a lot to do with how a drug or a medication acts, interacts with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Because the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are the strongest determinations of whether the pupil dilates or constricts. So, under alpha-1, alpha-1, uh, alpha-1 stimulation. <coughs> The pupil dilates uh, under alpha one. The pupil constricts under parasympathetic stimulation. So alpha one would be dilate. And parasympathetic stimulation would be constrict. Why? Alpha-1 is sympathetic, right? Sympathetic is fight or flight. Why would, why would animals evolve to the point to where stress, survival, would make their pupils dilate? Why would, why would that be? Think, think functionally, why would the animal become that way? Most animals historically do their predator, predatory work at night, and most wild animals do most of their predatory work at night because they want to give an advantage on their fellows. So a lot of predators attack at night. It would it would be to the advantage of any animal, and pre predator and the victim to have the ability to see well at night. So anytime an animal is under stress, what happens is the pupil dilates under alpha one, which is sympathetic, and the pupil dilates, gathers more light. Now the animal can see at night. There's a disadvantage though in having the pupil dilated. What's the disadvantage of having the pupil dilated? The pupil is dilated. Okay, here's, here's the eyeball. Now, in the front of your eyeball, sticks out, you have a lens, you have a lens here. Light comes in, crisscrosses, and fo focuses on the retina. The, the narrower the pupil, the less light comes in, but the bigger the focal distance. In other words, more stuff's under focus. Because what happens is, if the light comes in at a, if the light comes in at a narrow angle, you can, see a, you can see the distance between here is small. If the light comes in at a big angle, the distance between here is large. So the, the amount of focus is better when the light comes in at a, at a narrow angle. It, the camera works the same way. You've seen a picture where the, where the object's in the, the object's in focus, but five feet behind them is blurry, and that's done for effect. In some photographs, you want to make only the object in focus, and you want to make everything else blurry to emphasize what's in focus, and that's done on purpose. In the now, I put this cat up here. This is a great example. This is a classic fight or flight response. If you block alpha receptors, if you block alpha receptors, that'll constrict. Or if you block parasympathetic, that will dilate. Your eye doctor does this all the time. Your eye doctor will block the parasympathetic and make your pupils dilate. One of, the, one of the drugs you'll become most familiar with is called atropine. Atropine is one of the, the atropine's been around for over 100 years. It's a, it's a drug that was first discovered a long, long time ago. And it is related to a plant called nightshade, which is a toxic plant, but this plant blocks the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you give atropine, your pupils will go become real big. And when you go to the eye doctor to have an eye exam, he gives you something called home atropine, drops in your eye, and if you if you leave the doctor's office and go look in the mirror, it looks like you're dead. Your pupils are like you know, five millimeters, they're huge. So uh, next time you go to the eye doctor to have your eyes checked, then he gives you the drops and he gives you the, the dark glasses to wear at home, go look in the mirror, it'll freak you out. I mean, your pupils are like, you look like a dead person. People look at you and go, whoa, man, you look dead. Get out of here. Now, if you if you if you think about it, when you get in when you get into working cardiac emergencies, atropine is one of the more common drugs you get working cardiac emergencies. Atropine, when it blocks the parasympathetic nervous system, it will allow the heart to speed up. So if, you, if your heart's going too slow, and you give atropine, the heart will often speed up depending on what's causing the heart to go slow. So if the heart speeds up, great. But you have atropine in the body now. 
So from that point on, your pupils become unreliable. Why? Because your pupils are dilated. If you've given, if you, if you have somebody in cardiac arrest, or any, or any severe medical emergency, and you've just given them a dose of atropine into their veins, the pupils are no longer diagnostic or reliable. So I say, yeah, doctor, uh, he, had, he had dilated pupils, so I didn't, I didn't do anything. Well, you just gave atropine, of course they're dilated. So you, you can no longer use the pupils for diagnostic value once you've given atropine. The mechanism is how the body does it and why it does it, and then you'll understand what's going on. Don't just memorize a bunch of stuff. Understand why it is the way it is. Immunological disorders. Who can name any... In, in, what causes asthma? You have a bronchospasm. Your airway is constricted. Why? You, it, it's, an, it's an immune response. You are probably allergic to something, or you have a genetic predisposition, or a combination of those. But why do some people suddenly can't breathe and get bronchoconstriction and, other, and others don't? If you're the person who has asthma, and there's probably some genetic component, but we'll talk about the, the, per, the allergic type of asthma, which is more common. Someone will be allergic to something in the environment. It could be a pollutant in the air. It could be a pollen. It could be something that they've come in contact with. Um, it's extremely complex. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals that you come in contact with every day. Your immune system will recognize some of them as not being a threat. It'll recognize other ones as being a threat. And that depends kind of on, on your specific immune system. If you're sensitized to something and somebody else doesn't have a problem with it, there's a lot of variability to that. But let's take somebody that has asthma and they come in contact with something. So they'll have an antigen antibody reaction. Antigen antibody reaction. So the antigen or whatever they're allergic to will be in the body. It'll be recognized by the immune system. Macrophage will attach. It calls in the antibodies. And let's take a classic asthma, allergic asthma. They will have a higher titer of IgE antibodies. So the antigen antibody reaction is going to trigger an immune response. And when the antibodies attach to the antigen, they activate something called mast cells. One of the most important is something called leukotrienes. Leukotrienes and histamine. Histamine and leukotrienes are the two that cause the most trouble with asthma. Leukotrienes is a class of chemicals that's manufactured out of the cell wall during an immune reaction. And what happens is arachidonic acid, arachidonic acid is converted into prostaglandin, and it's converted into prostaglandin by something called a COX enzyme, COX. And that stands for cyclooxygenase. But also, arachidonic acid is also converted into a family, of, a family of leukotrienes. And one of the leukotrienes, called leukotriene D, for dog, is the main chemical mediator of asthma and bronchospasm. Leukotriene D is probably the main chemical in the body that causes bronchospasm and an asthma attack. Histamine, a little bit, but mainly leukotriene D. And they discovered this about 20 years ago. And they developed a whole family of drugs to block leukotrienes. So a lot of the asthma medications today are leukotriene receptor antagonists. They block leukotrienes. If the generic name of the drug ends in CAST, K-A-S-T, there's three or four of them. The generic name of the drug ends in K-A-S-T, CAST. And they're, they're taken by asthma patients. And any people that have bronchospastic lung disease will take this class of medicine. If a drug ends in O-L-O-L, -O -L, it's a beta blocker. You will need to know, if, a patient's, if, if you go to the patient's house and they're on a medicine, and the generic ends in O-L-O-L, -O -L, you know it's a beta blocker. There's, I can't think of a single exception to that rule. If the generic name, it has to be the generic name. These rules only apply to generics, not the brand name. Like, the brand name would be low pressor, and the generic is metoprolol, but you notice the generic ends in O-L-O-L. Enderol is propranolol, ends in O-L-O-L. There's about 10 beta blockers. They all end in O-L-O-L. So if you see that, you know it's a beta blocker. If it ends in P-R-I-L, it's an ACE inhibitor. 
So blood pressure medicines like enalapril, there's, there's about 10 different ACE inhibitors. They will all, the, the generic will all end in PRIL. That means it's an ACE inhibitor. It's blood pressure. These are all blood pressure medicines. Yeah, they do other stuff too. But beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, those are also blood pressure medicines. Okay, ramipril, lisinopril, enalapril, moexipril. Notice, notice they're all pril. Oh, here's, here's one. Here's, here's the see here. Enalapril, ramipril, enalapril. If it, ends in, if it ends in A-R-T-A-N, it's an angiotensin II blocker, what they call ARB. Angiotensin receptor blocker. These are blood pressure medicines. Every patient that you go to their house are going to be on one of these probably. So you need, you need to be able to know the, the method by which you can figure it out. There's a bunch of these. Candesartan is called Atacan. Eprosartan is called Hepatin. Herbisartan is called Avapro. Losartan is called Cozar. Omasartan is called Benicar. Telemasartan is called Micardis. Valsartan is called Diavan. You've probably heard of Diavan, Micardis, Benicar, Cozar. These are blood pressure drugs. But if you look in the generic name, every one of them ends in ARTAN. And like I said a minute ago, if, if, it, ends in, if it ends in KAST, it's a leukotriene blocker, but those are more rare. You don't see those very often. You only see those people with, age, with like asthma and stuff. But these you will see all the time. There's, there's, two, there's two families of calcium channel blockers, but the, the biggest family called the dihydropyridines, they all end in PINE, nifedipine, nisoldipine, nitrindipine, nicardipine. The, all of these drugs are also blood pressure medicines. And they all end in, they all end in PINE. They're also blood pressure medicines. So if you, learn, if you learn these four endings, you know 90% of the blood pressure medicines and what they are, because they all work in the same way within the class. Okay, the two classes, one, now this, you don't have to know this, but this will make sense when I tell you in a minute. You have dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines. The dihydropyridines are almost all of them. Almost, almost all calcium channel blockers are dihydropyridines. And uh, I'll click on dihydropyridines. Here, here we go. Norvat. Amlodipine. These are all the hydropyridines. They all notice how every one of them is in peen. See that? Norvas amlodipine. Mass is something. How heavy it is how how much it weighs. And the faster something goes, the more kinetic energy it'll have. The more something weighs, the more kinetic energy it'll have. However, the velocity is much more important than the weight. Cars. Car crump, you know, it crumples, but the car can't go any farther, so the car stops pretty quick. Person in the car, it's still moving at 60 miles an hour. The, the person keeps going until it hits the inside of the car, steering wheel. And, but hopefully, the, the person has restraint devices. He has a seat belt and airbags. If the seat belt and airbags work properly, then that's going to absorb a lot of the kinetic energy and it's going to slow, slow down the rate at which the person decelerates. And so the, the impact is spread out over a larger area and over a larger time period, which is even more important. And so the energy is such to where the body can absorb it without too much damage. The faster that you come to a rest, the more, the more tissue damage is going to be. Cars now are designed to help absorb impact. If you go back and get like a 1957 Chevy, you know, the car is real heavy and it's, and it's, it's a strong car. But it's not built to absorb energy. It transfers all the energy to the occupants. So the car basically stays intact more than a modern car. And so that energy is transferred to the person sitting in the car, and the person you know, gets killed. A modern car is made to actually crumple up. And as a car crumples up, it's absorbing the energy and dissipating the energy through the body frame. That's why if you look at a race car, if you watch like Indy 500 and watch these cars wreck, the car is totally destroyed, it just flies apart. And then you see the guy get up and walk out without an injury. That often happens because they design those cars to crumple in certain places and absorb the kinetic energy. So the energy absorbed by the occupants. Uh, they have ro roll bars and helmets, special helmets, and strapped in all kinds of ways. But the modern car is much, much, much better at absorbing the energy and not transferring the energy to the driver. If you look at highway deaths, fatalities here were increasing rapidly 
mainly because of the number of people on the road and the number of available roads. When cars were first coming out in the early 1900s, there were just very few cars and very few roads, so there weren't very many accidents. But anyway, as cars became more and more, as more and more people could afford cars, and as they, they, they developed more and more roads, the amount of fatalities went, went up and up and up and up. From 1966 to 1969 was the absolute peak of traffic deaths. Now, certain things happened right here that changed everything. Number one, you remember the white paper came out and it said, we suck, you know. Uh, the whole system just reeked. So they started developing emergency medical service and people started looking at why people died in car wrecks. So then seat belts became mandatory about then. They started having to, I think 1969 is when they started to install or make mandatory. They started installing seat belts around here. The white paper came out, EMS changed. They started to understand why deaths occurred. And as seat belts became mandatory, this started coming down. Just, just from that, this started coming down. And then they started developing crumple zones and doing actual studies. The, also, the highway department started putting in more guardrails. They started putting reflect, reflectors, things on the side so you could see where the edge of the road was, white lines. If you go back and look at a road in the 1940s, they were thin. Uh, there were no limited access highways. The, the, the interstate, interstate system wasn't built until Eisenhower approved it in the late 50s and early 60s, so there were no interstate highways. All roads were one going this way, you know, two lane roads. The, the edge of the road didn't have white lines half the time. There were no reflector stickers, no guardrails. You'd be going along and there would just be concrete poles right next to the road, and if you happened to lose control right then, boom, you're dead. And, and cars were not engineered well. Um, so many things back then were terrible. And the highway deaths reached like, I think, 54,000 people died per year in that time period. And then it started coming down. As we started getting better highways, better research into crumple zones, um, engineered cars better, the, this has just continued to come down. Now, it's kind of leveled off. It's actually amazing that this came down so much because all during this time, there were more and more roads and more and more cars and more people driving. So the, the fatal accident per thousand miles is really quite astounding how much better it's gotten. Because if, if this is while there were more people driving, so you would think this would have continued to go up anyway. So there's been, there's been vast improvements in highway safety because of uh, a lot of the analysis that was done because of that terrible time period right here. So when you, when you come up and you're looking at um, the kinetic energy, when you're coming up to a scene, you want to think about, what do, when I see the scene, what am I looking at? You look at the car, you look at the mechanism of injury, you look at the kinetics of the, of the situation. If you see a car that's all crumpled up, that used to be, the person's going to be dead if the car's crumpled. The front of the car's all smashed up, the person's probably going to be dead. Anymore, that's not true. Because the car's designed to do that, and because of air seat belts, you can often see the car crumpled up and you walk out and people walking around with, with no injury. So that's actually amazing. When I first started EMS, tell how bad they were going to be injured by the way the car was. If the car was, you know, if you saw the front of the car had been reduced by like 50% and you could see parts of the engine sticking out, the person was usually either unconscious or dead. But now you'll frequently get there and the person will be out playing on their cell phone or something. It's crazy. So cars, cars have improved a lot. But still, you can derive a lot, of a lot of information by what the car looks like when you come up. You can imagine the forces involved. You always want to make sure that the person had their seatbelt on. It was the airbag deployed. If the airbag was deployed, that tells you something. Cars are designed with an accelerometer. What's an accelerometer? There's an instrument in the car that has airbags, and it actually measures how fast that's stopping. And if you really smash into something hard, the accelerometer will say, that's sufficient force that this person's probably going to get injured. And it'll deploy the airbag. If, if that force is not met, the, the airbag won't, won't deploy. So if you see that airbags deploy, that tells you that that's a, a, you know, a significant deceleration. So you look at that. If the car is sitting from the back, like if here's a car seat, here's a headrest up here. If the car was sitting from the back, Always look to see if the headrest is is uh, up. Old old cars, like if you look at a '57 Chevy, they didn't have a headrest. The, the seat ended about down here, and there was nothing up there. So any any rear end collision, everybody had whiplash or had a broken neck. It was terrible. So then they started putting in they started putting in headrests, 
So now, what happens is if the car sits in the back, the entire person is going to accelerate evenly, and the head's not going to you know, get, get a whiplash injury. But if this isn't in the right position, you can still get a significant acceleration of the neck. So when you have a force applied to the body, we kind of break it down into two major areas. One, and penetrating. Basically, anything that doesn't break the skin would be considered blunt force trauma. It could be crushing, but anything that doesn't go inside the body is considered blunt force. If you hit somebody in the head with a baseball bat, if you punch somebody with your fist, if you beat somebody with a tire arm, as long as it doesn't go inside of their body, it's considered blunt force trauma. With blunt force trauma, the energy is dissipated over a different area than penetrating trauma. In penetrating trauma, the force is usually very localized to where the object goes into the body. Let's say you stab somebody with a knife. Here's a tissue. You stab somebody with a knife. The knife goes in here. The knife gets pulled out. Well, the damage is usually going to be limited to wherever the knife went in and came out. The tissue out here, the tissue out here is not going to be disrupted that much because all of the, all of the trauma happened to where the, the knife penetrated. Now, knife goes very slow. There's very little energy involved. Most of the damage is done by the blade itself just going in and going out. Not so with a bullet. In a bullet, you have completely different kinetics. Take a high-powered rifle, piece of tissue. Even if the bullet, bullet's that big, okay? So if the bullet goes through, okay? You're going to see a, a series of really neat things called shock waves. Sometimes these are invisible, a lot of times you can see them. It's, it's due to a shock wave, and the shock wave has such a pressure change on each side of it, changes in atmospheric pressure because of the, the, energy, move, the energy moving out from it. This energy, what creates it, creates a wave. Now, the bullet does the same thing. The bullet also has energy coming out in a big cone like this. So when a bullet goes in, it's going to make a little teeny hole because the energy wave hasn't hit the tissue yet. But as, as the bullet goes through, it's going to make a huge, it's going to make a huge disruption in the tissue according to the shock wave. The shock wave is equally proportional to the mass and times the square of the velocity. So this is called cavitation. The exit wound is, is, is almost the size of the cavitation. So where the bullet goes in, it's going to be no, no much bigger than the bullet. Where it comes out, it's going to be almost as big as the cavitation. So the exit wound can be like this big, where the entrance wound is no bigger than the bullet. So you can normally tell which way it went in and out by how big the wounds are. Well, the, the higher the velocity, the more it does that. Um, and you might see a little bullet hole, a little bullet hole over the liver, and you think, well, there's a little hole in the liver. Then you get inside there, and the liver is like it exploded. So let's talk about the amount of energy transfer according to the type of tissue. Take a hollow organ, hollow organ, right? Em empty bladder, empty stomach, empty colon. Okay, no problem, right? Okay, fill it full of water. I used to do this in my class. This is too much of class. But I, used to, I used to do this in my class. I'd say, full of water, wham! Well, everybody knows what happens if you take it and fill it full of water. Not me. <laughs> full bladder, full colon, full stomach, or a tissue that's dense like the liver. You can imagine what happens when that gets an energy wave going through it. And everybody knows, you throw this full of water. So, if you are in a car wreck, okay, and your, em your empty bladder has a pressure wave go through, it's probably not going to do much. Take the liver, liver's very dense. Everybody's eating liver and knows what it's very heavy. It's, all, it's almost all tissue, which means it's almost all water, because most tissue is water anyway. So it's like, it's like this full of water. You throw that and hit the wall or have the kinetic energy hit it and now that it's got more mass, more inertia, the energy transfer is much greater and now you're going to bust. So an organ that's dense is much more likely to be in injured by energy wave than a hollow, hollow organ. Now, if you notice the liver has several lobes, 
the liver is kind of anchored in the chest by something called the ligamentum teres. Ligamentum teres. It, it divides the big lobe from the small lobe, and it's, it's kind of like a little sheet of tissue that runs through it, and it helps anchor it and hold it in place. The only problem is, is if your abdomen decelerates quickly, this ligament sits still and tries to keep the liver with, it tries to keep hold the liver still, but the, but the rest of the liver is being heavy and it and it keeps it keeps trying to go. So, you ever seen a, a, a cheese cutter? Piece of cheese, and you have a little wire, and you push that wire through and it cuts right through the cheese. Well, the ligamentum teres acts like a wire cutter going through cheese. What happens is that's anchored into the chest or into the abdomen. It's kind of anchored to the posterior abdomen tries to hold the liver in place. The rest of the liver keeps trying to go forward, so it kind of slices the liver in half. So you can tear the liver right along this ligament when you decelerate rapidly, or if your abdomen hits a steering wheel, or abdomen hits a dashboard, even if your abdomen hits, hits an airbag, it can be enough to do that and tear the liver. You see a lot of liver injuries when the abdomen hits something rapidly like that. One of the most dangerous of them all, though, is the one that anchors the aorta. Now, before you were born, your circulation was a little bit different. Your fetal circulation was a little bit different. Your pulmonary artery and your aorta were actually connected together with something called a patent ductus arteriosus. It connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta right here. And that's called the ductus arteriosus. Now, after you're born, this shrivels up, but it doesn't go away. It turns into a fibrous ligament called the ligamentum arteriosum. It anchors the pulmonary artery in the aorta and kind of holds it to the posterior chest wall. It kind of anchors it in place. Now, here's the problem. Now you slam your chest into a steering wheel or an airbag or anything where your chest decelerates rapidly. Because of the way your chest is built and because of the way the ribs, picture the chest wall and the, connect, the sternum connects to the ribs, connects to the backbone. So that acts like, your, your, that acts like a one unit. So as the force hits your sternum, that, that, that deceleration is transferred to the whole rib cage, and the whole rib cage slows down pretty quick because it's all one unit, because they're all tied together. And because the ribs act like a little trampoline, they kind of help slow the chest down as a unit. The heart is kind of hanging inside there. It keeps going. So as the chest wall stops, the heart wants to keep going. So the heart starts traveling this way, the aorta, though, is anchored. The aorta is a very posterior organ. It goes right down the spine, and it's really, it's actually retroperitoneal. It's actually anchored in the very back of the chest. So it's, the back of it's held in place. It, the back of it can't keep going. The heart can keep going because the heart's just hanging there. As this keeps going and this is anchored, the stress is transferred to this area here where the aortic arch comes around. And the ligamentum arteriosum holds this structure here and acts like a knife. And, it's, and when, this area, when, when this goes like that, the ligamentum arteriosum tears the aorta right across where it's anchored. So if you look at from the front, here's the heart in the front. You see the aorta here. Here's the pulmonary artery going like this. And where the ligamentum arteriosum is, it tears the aorta right across there. These people will die in five minutes. They will be dead when you get to the scene if this happens. The only thing that can save them is if, is if it causes a partial tear, and then they get a dissection where the blood will start leaking between the layers of the artery. Remember, we talked about dissections. The blood will start going between the layers of the artery, and they'll get tremendous chest pain. And if this busts, they'll still die in a few minutes. But if you get there and, and they're having real bad chest pain, and, and you know they've decelerated like that, you always have to consider these things. Because if this, if this just breaks, they'll be, they'll be in cardiac arrest by the time you get there. These days, not as much as it used to because of, because of the safety factors. Um, you'll run a call like this maybe every five or six years. I mainly wanted to talk about the kinetics of trauma and not go into specific trauma things because we have, we have an entire part of the class for trauma. Uh, what's, what's iatrogenic mean? An iatrogenic disease is one that they wouldn't have got had they not gone to the doctor or the hospital. It's a disease that's brought on by healthcare. In other words, had you not gone to the doctor, you wouldn't have got this particular problem. So it can be all kinds of stuff. It can be an infectious disease that you pick up at the hospital. 
It can be malpractice. It can be leaving a it can be leaving a clamp inside somebody during surgery. There's all kinds of ways that the doctor can screw somebody up. In fact, the first adage of medicine is, is first do no harm. You don't want to make things worse. That's why in the, when, when you start doing scenarios, and you're going to do, you're going to do a million scenarios by the time you get out of class. When we're, when we're here in the lab, you're going to do scenarios and scenarios and scenarios. You're going to take scenarios. But they're important because when people first start doing scenarios, they, they have to kind of unlearn things. You, you First, do no harm. You don't want to do things that are going to make it worse. Iatrogenic. Some of, the, some of the things today that you'll see is certain bacterial infections that are pretty uncommon out of the world, but are more common in people that have been in hospitals. There's something called a nosocomial infection. A nosocomial infection is an infection that's acquired at a healthcare facility or a hospital. Or it can be a nursing home, anywhere the patient gets medical care, anywhere where sick people congregate. Certain infections tend to run rampant there that, that are uncommon out in the general public, like a Clostridium difficile. It's a very hard to treat infection. The reason it's hard to treat is because it's Clostridium. That's a spore former. These bacteria are tenacious. It takes a lot of antibiotics and a lot of treatment to get rid of a Clostridium bacteria. Sometimes it takes hyperbaric oxygen. Sometimes it takes a strong antibiotics or a long-term IV antibiotics. So MERS is another big one you'll hear. What's idiopathic? Yeah, it means unknown. What does idiopathic mean if you break down the word idiopathic? It just means a disease of itself. Now, idiopathic diseases all have a cause. We just don't know what they are. And most idiopathic diseases are probably a combination of genetic or autoimmune. Because these are the ones that are not well understood until recently. As time goes on, more and more idiopathic diseases will, will have a cause that we'll come up with. But whenever a disease doesn't have an apparent cause, then they, they just say it's idiopathic. Did I go over the, the liver's portal circulation? Okay. Before we get into heart, I want to talk about a specific instance. Okay. Here's the liver. Liver. Where does the liver get its oxygenated blood from? The liver itself gets its, gets its oxygen, now the, the liver tissue itself stays alive, its oxygenated blood comes from some called hepatic, hepatic artery. Now, after the liver does its thing, it drains its own venous blood, its own venous blood back into the vena cava through the hepatic vein. The liver, though, has another system of blood vessels, completely separate from the hepatic artery and the hepatic vein. Here's the intestines. All the, when the intestines are processing nutrients and all that blood is getting absorbed into the bloodstream. All of that stuff is full of nutrients, full of toxins, full of all this goo that's coming in from the GI tract. That can't, that can't go right to the central circulation. It would screw everything up. It has to go to the liver to be processed. So all of these blood vessels that are coming off the GI tract go into the liver. They go into the liver through the port, portal vein. The portal vein is taking all that blood from the GI tract into the liver to be processed. The liver is going to take out nutrients, do all kinds of processing, take out toxins, take this out, put this in, move this over here, do all kinds of stuff. It's a huge system, and that's important because all it's a huge amount of blood, and it comes into the liver from the portal system, and this is the active part of the liver processing this blood. Now, suppose this person, let's say, is an alcoholic, and they're, they've poisoned their liver year after year after year after year, now they've developed a disease called cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a disease of the liver that's where the alcohol has gradually poisoned it. And what happens is the blood vessels that bring the portal blood to the liver over time become very stiff, and a lot of them get destroyed, and basically it makes it harder for the blood to get into the liver, it, it increases the resistance to blood flow of the portal vein coming into the liver because the liver is diseased. So what happens to the pressure in the portal vein? Right, it goes up. Because now there's blood trying to get into the liver, but it can't. So this blood backs up. So they get what's called portal vein hypertension. We'll just say portal vein pressure goes up. Don't get this confused with regular hypertension. This doesn't affect the blood pressure you take on the arm. But if they get portal vein hypertension, the body has several ways that this blood can try to reroute itself back to the central circulation and bypass the liver as an emergency. What's, what's an anastomosis? If you have a blood vessel, let's say here's two blood vessels, and they join each other through a network. Blood can go 
Blood can go through these blood vessels. It can also cross over and go down the other one, right? So if you block off this one, blood can go a different route and go through this one, right? Remember the circle of Willis in the brain is, is a type of anastomosis where blood vessels can connect and reconnect and reconnect. In other words, the blood has more than one way of getting somewhere because there's a network of vessels that interconnect. These are, these are called anastomosis where there's more than one way the blood can travel somewhere. So, the portal system has several important anastomoses where the blood can try to get back to the vena cava without having to go through the liver because it's hard... The, the pressure here is backing up. It can't all go through the liver. If the pressure backs up here forever, it's, you know, the person's going to die. So this blood tries to reroute itself to avoid the liver. There's the, two, the two most important places are there's, vein, there's anastomosis that go up the esophageal veins. Here's the esophagus coming down. These esophageal veins that run around the esophagus. And you have umbilical, para-umbilical veins. Here's your navel. You have veins. If you look at somebody's belly button... Take somebody who's got a beer belly and look at their stomach. Those veins that kind of radiate out from the navel. Those are umbilical veins. The portal system has anastomosis with the umbilical veins here and the esophageal veins here. So this blood, as the pressure gets higher, it can reroute itself and try to get back to the vena cava and bypass the liver. There's a problem, though. These veins, they're supposed to do their own thing. They're supposed to drain the blood from the esophagus. So now they have all this extra blood going into them. And the umbilical veins have all this extra blood going into them. So what happens if you put extra blood into a vein? It gets, it gets bigger, it dilates. Everybody seen varicose veins? Okay. If you have too much blood in a vein, over time it'll stretch out and get real big and gnarly looking. Now you can't see the esophageal veins normally because they line the esophagus. But then you get varicose veins that line the esophagus. People have varicose veins, those are leg varices. People have a esophageal varices, have varicose veins inside the esophagus.